right, so um, hello everyone. Um, I'm Catalina, and today I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, this project I've been working on for my PhD, um, where we've developed this me method called Later. Um, that's a Bayesian inference method for estimating selection parameters and testing for selection in genome-wide time series data sets. I'm based at the University of St Andrews in Scotland, but this is work done in collaboration with Rui Borges um, at the Institute of PopGen in Vienna and my supervisor, Carolyn Koziel. Okay, so we evolutionary biologists tend to spend a lot of time trying to come up with population genetics models um, so we can actually have some predictions about what's going to happen um, with our populations, the populations that we're studying, and how they're going to evolve. Um, but the, cr the question here is, um, in nature, it's not so trivial to actually generalize these models, because if we're only studying the one population, there's absolutely no replicability, so we can't really assess whether um, these models we've created are generalizable or not. So that's why we turn to the lab and study evolution in the lab instead. So as um, Anna um, already mentioned this morning, we tend to combine experimental evolution with um, next generation sequencing. So in a way, we just go into the lab um, and we have the selective pressure that we want to impose on our populations and we replicate them um, as well. And then what we do is track any changes whatsoever that happen to our, um, that occur in our experimental populations, both at the phenotypic level um, across generations and at the genotypic level as well. Um, and these um, evolve and resequence experiments, as we call them, what we do is we tend to sample our populations every now and again, um, and we then resequence our population's genomes, um, to sort of try and come up with some allo frequency estimates. But the question here is, um, we don't usually sample all the population, right? We don't resequence the genome of the entire population, nor are each single lo loci in the genome sequenced to the same coverage, uh, which means that the allo frequencies that we actually get are estimates, and they have some uncertainty, uncertainty associated with them. Um, and this is something just to keep in mind when we analyze our data, because it might lead to spurious results. Um, the idea here really is to test for selection and find signatures of selection in the genome, right? Um, and based on we can, what we can measure, these changes in allo frequency across time, we can do that. But the question here is, um, one of the main points is the fact that we don't really have data on each single generation, for at each single generation, which means that um, this might lead us not to be able to detect selection necessarily. But it's also the fact that in small populations, it's definitely hard to tease apart the signatures of selection in genomic data and those of drift. Um, so that's why we need to come up with clever statistical models um, to test and estimate selection. Um, so this is our model. Uh, that's what, exactly what we did. We created beta. It's um, a Bayesian inference model um, method, really, um, that is available online. You can see the link um, at the bottom. It's um, a method that allows us to both test for selection and um, estimate selection parameters. And what we do is we model our frequency trajectories um, and we try to, um, we do that by actually fully utilizing the genome-wide time series data and to um, also look for consistency across replicate populations um, in terms of how they're responding to this selective pressure that we've imposed on them. So, okay, now I'm gonna go a bit into detail about our model. Um, so Beta implements this mechanistic model of allele count evolution 
um, it's really a branching process. It's a RAN model. Um, and the really interesting thing about this model is that it allows for overlapping generations. Um, this is actually quite important because in so many large scale um, evolution experiments in the lab, um, these populations actually have overlapping generations. So this is definitely a plus of our model. And what we do then, um, what our model does is sort of try and track um, the, mod the evolution of this allele capital A. And to do that, we model in the evolution of its counts across generations, here referred to by the small n. Um, we explicitly model selection by introducing the selection coefficient parameter called sigma here. And what we expect is that n um, across generations, if it does increase in frequency um, in the state space, it suggests that there is some selection coefficient uh, allowing it to spread across the population. And well, as I've told you, because this is a Bayesian method, we then calculate the posterior distribution of this selection coefficient sigma. Um, and the final step is really just testing for selection by calculating the ratio of the likelihoods between two alternative models. Um, and this is just what is commonly called the base factor. Um, in our case, we'd be comparing, we are comparing two different method, two different models, one with selection and a second one without um, selection. Um, right, a bit more detail about our algorithm. So it, what it does is <clears throat> sort of starts off by computing these virtual LL frequency trajectories by taking into account both the affected population size at that specific locus. And um, it also includes this important binomial sampling step that's here really just to mimic the effect of varying sequencing depth um, across the genome, because as I've told you before, um, it is not necessarily the case that the sequencing depth is the same for every single um, locus, and that's actually often <laughs> not the case. Um, so what we do is, as we calculate the probability of observing some specific state given um, the observed count C and this total sequencing depth that we've uh, also obtained D. The next step is then to calculate the full likelihood um, um, of a given selection coefficient sigma, given that we've observed these counts C and this sequencing depth value D. Um, and again, three more steps. Uh, we compute the posterior of sigma, the posterior distribution of sigma by fitting it to a gamma surface, just the detail here, and we then estimate its mean. And finally, we compute this base factor that I've just mentioned, and this is us. This is we have an estimate of sigma here, and um, also a test statistic to sort of um, give us a little a sense of whether um, we're detecting targets of selection or not. Okay, so as you can imagine, when you create um, some method or some new software. You're gonna to have to test it extensively. And that's basically what we did. We simulated a bunch of allele frequency trajectories and um, under very many different scenarios. And these are some of the results. So uh, if you look at the bottom of this plot here, uh, when we varied the total number of replicate populations uh, ranging from two to 10, uh, for different size populations, as well as different selection coefficients, we can see that beta actually performs quite well, right? Um, most of these squares in the heat map are fairly light blue, which is good news, it means the error is quite small. Um, it does, however, show a bit of underperformance for scenarios where the populations are fairly, very small, and where there are only very few uh, replicate populations. But um, we also wanted to test whether um, the sequencing depth had some sort of um, effect on our methods performance, like we did just previously with the number of replicate populations. Um, but it seems as though for coverage, well, the effect is not as pronounced, and even if we do vary it, 
um, as you can see here at the bottom, um, beta performs overall quite well, um, apart from these um, few um, scenarios where populations are very small again, um, and coverage is um, fairly low, 20 times. Um, okay, so simulations are very nice, but um, we also want to make sure that our method performs well um, with real data, right? <laughs> So what we did was we took um, a NIDA's data set, NIDA and co-authors actually published this data set back in 2019, and Anna's mentioned it earlier today as well. Um, I'll just do a quick recap. Um, basically, they've set up this experiment um, using Drosophila simulant populations. Um, they've replicated them 10 times, so 10 replicate populations, and they track by revolution for um, 60 generations. Um, so we took their data and applied beta. Um, and what you can see here is just our test statistic, the base factors, along this chromosome arm, and our, in this case is just um, the right arm, the chromosome 3. And as you can see, beta is actually picking up some signals of selection, right? There are um, a few clear peaks that um, seem to show that there is regional um, selection happening. Um, and this is quite satisfying because it seems um, that beta is actually quite conservative and not just telling us that um, there is selection all across the genome, so that was a very good result. Um, but then we thought, okay, it's probably a good idea that we compare our results with the results that um, Nedder and her co-authors um, had shown us previously. And so just um, a, quick, a quick recap then. This is, um, we're comparing our base factors with the p-value te test results for the, C um, the cochrane mantel hensel test. Um, that's really just commonly used um, across these evolving resequence experiments. And what we can see here, well, in this plot, we've got four quadrants. Um, the top left one is the one that tells us that um, the p-values um, obtained by the CMH test were deemed significant. Beta didn't agree so much. Um, and it seems like that this quadrant is actually filled with data. Um, this top right quadrant is the one where both methods agree that there is selection, significant selection um, at that locus, um, suggesting that beta is actually fairly more conservative than the CMH in this case. Um, okay, so hopefully I've convinced you now that we've developed uh, this Bayesian inference method that actually performs quite well in small populations. And when we sort of compare it to other approaches, it's rather conservative. And this is data that I've not shown you, but that we've also tested um, extensively. When we compare beta with other software, um, it is quite computationally efficient, which is very good because um, it means it's useful um, for analyzing time series, genome-wide time series data sets that are actually quite large. Um, and okay, that is me. I'd like to thank um, everyone in my group and um, people at the department um, at St Andrews University um, for very fruitful discussions, as well as NEDA for early discussions on how to implement our, our method on actually real life data sets. Um, and finally, um, big, big thanks to Peter Thorpe from the St Andrews Bioinformatics Unit, who actually helped us sort of set beta up on multiple platforms and servers and all of that. And thank you for listening. And I'll take any questions.